for being down here. The last few times, I think we've had a better discussion in this format than you do up in the chamber. And again, the ability to listen and ask questions is always uh, uh, a valuable thing. So with that, Dr. Joseph, thank you so much for being here. This thank is you. actually our the final budget meeting, I believe, <laughs> in this whole long process. I don't know if they do this more easily in Maryland than they do it here. But Not this, really. This take, okay. All right. That makes us feel better. That makes us feel better. But thank you, and thank all three uh, representatives from MMPS to yeah. be here today. Uh, and again, again, our point here, we're definitely going to be out of here by 6 o'clock. Your part of this will be a lot quicker. Um, I, Everybody feel free to just be direct and ask and answer questions, and then we'll try to move on. No disrespect, but um, want to be sensitive to everybody's time. Thank you. Thank you. And does this work? And so if, if and I don't know if you had anything that you wanted to bring to our attention uh, to the start. There clearly, if you're looking for some things we'd like comment on, um, the school nurses I yes. think is very much in the front of everybody's mind at this table yes. about how to find funding for it and it's their utility and value to the school system and to the county. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all for having us here uh, once again. And uh, to address the school nurses, you know, we, we recognize that we have lots of students with great needs within the district. And we believe by investing in our school nurses, uh, we will have the capacity to better serve our students. So we're, we were asking for... Uh, and uh, three uh, to phase in to have over a hundred to have a hundred nurses over three years uh, this year to phase in 13 more nurses within to our the school system uh, at a cost of about nine hundred seventeen thousand uh, dollars you know the nurses focus on students medical plans uh, right now we have uh, one nurse serving three to four schools and we want to be able to reduce that ratio uh, as we as we move uh, towards it uh, you know, our goal is after three years to get very close to the standard of one nurse for every 750 uh, students. We're, we're off that right now. Um, you know, it's an excellent partnership that we have with the, our, our public health uh, office here. So uh, supporting us to support the nurses would, would do, uh, go a great way to make sure, you know, our students are getting the services that they need. But I can just answer any questions that you have specifically. Yeah, well, uh, shall we start down on this side, Council Lady? Thank you. So, when I think of going to a school nurse, I think of the you know, typical low grade kind of illnesses, you know, basic fever, maybe, you know, just a uh, scratch, maybe something that wouldn't be, um, I guess, a high ranking nurse. So, what level of education do these nurses have to be? And that's, that's really more of a question for the health department, but we, since we already have them, they, they are actual RNs uh, in, in most cases, uh, where they currently, as Dr. Joseph indicated, uh, with the, the number that we have, they're providing services to students on medical plans, um, but they would also be available if we were to increase the number for those kinds of things that you, that you mentioned that could be more lower grade in nature, uh, but they would be available to, to help students uh, with those kinds of ailments, whether it be a fever, whether it be a, a cough, in addition to continuing to provide the services to our medically fragile students. Mm -hmm. And what is the, what are we paying them now? What's their salary on average? Um, Around $70,000. Yeah, it, it's, it's through the Metro Public Health Department. We have a contract with the health department, and so they actually pay them, and then we pay the, the health department based upon the services that, that, that we need and based upon our budget. Mm -hmm. Have we looked at doing anything to have an intern with some of the, you know, Vanderbilt and Harry and these sort of things? Uh, public health is here. I don't know if they want to address some of those questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, Please. Do you want to just come sit down? Yeah, yeah. Sit sure. Have we ever looked at doing some kind of a partnership with um, any of our hospitals or Meharry to, you know, have to try to save money? Because seventy thousand dollars obviously is a lot of money, and I was just trying to save some money in that aspect. There was until recently. You guys can correct me. I believe there was there were two nurses that were paid for by Vanderbilt as I think sort of a way to get practice for for them that has 
ended, as I understand. So right now, that that is not the case. Um, they are they are not full time employees. They are point seven one FTEs. They work during the school year. Um, we would not object to that. I, I, I couldn't. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear the the first part. The 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 proposal um, at this point is to move towards the um, one per seven fifty over a period of time, uh, as was proposed in a one of the public investment plans that that was uh, that was a. Uh, recommended by the mayor, although the funding was at the time, originally was included in the school board's budget, and then it was not, and so and that's where we are. One other question about our salaries, could you speak to that? Uh, I, I, I don't know exactly what they are, frankly. I know the contract now is, I want to say it's about four something million dollars a year, I believe, for 60. 60 some odd. But that also includes supervisors, et cetera. It does, right. So I, I'm sorry, I, I can get that number certainly, but I don't have it off the top of my head. It, com it comes in at seventy thousand two hundred thirty dollars, and I'm assuming that's with bennies and everything. That's, yeah. yeah, I'm sure it would be. And it's yeah. similar to a teacher salary, salary plus benefits. Similar, similar to a teacher position. I think if they were serving seven hundred fifty students, or I guess one per school, we should say. And um, how busy really would they be? I mean, they would have to be there all day long. How busy are they? And can we use them in the school for something else? I don't know what, but um, can we use them for something else? You know, busy. So. <clears throat> I'd say nurse, nurses are typically busy depending on the size of the school and the communities that they serve. I mean, they, from, again, doing physical, students always come in with uh, some type of ailment or, or issues, and, and they can be very proactive. I mean, they, in lots of um, school systems, nurses, are, through the nurse's office, you get the, you know, hearing screenings and the, um, the, the visual checks and so forth, but it, it's a constantly busy place, and they, they keep a roll sheet. We can probably capture data and communicate data on on average how often you know how many visits our school nurses get, but typically it's it's a pretty busy place. Okay. But this is this is something we should emphasize because currently nurses are stretched so thin that they're only able to address students' medical plans. And so a student who just is coming in because they have a cold and feels like they need to go home, they go home instead of being able to be seen by a school nurse now. And so if we had an adequate number of school nurses to keep the kids in the school, then we can do a better job of educating them. And we serve the city with vulnerable students, as y'all well know. And so this is a vital way that we'd be able to help keep the kids in mm -hmm. schools healthier and on task. Yeah, and I will say, you know, both the student and staff absenteeism is, is very high. And uh, we feel having, having a nurse in, in the buildings can, can address that. I mean, but that's one of the targeted goals for our strategic plan this year, really, you know, aggressively going after student absenteeism. Uh. Thank you, Council Lady. Um, I saw uh, can Councilman Bednay, did you? No. Okay, all right. C coming down this, this side. Anybody? Okay. Councilman Glover. Well, I'm not going to be popular on what I'm going to say. Um, while I agree that the nurses should be there, I, I do believe it's the board's responsibility to prioritize and determine where the money's going to go. I think if it's that important, then it's probably more important to do that than it is to pull people out and bring them back into central office in some of the positions that you're doing. Again, that's my opinion, because I've seen it in the past on pulling the people and moving them back into middle, middle management positions. I don't know exactly what you're paying for that. Uh, and again, it's not really, it's not our responsibility because we give you the money and you, you, you spend it the way you guys see fit. But while I agree that um, it would be nice to have the nurses, I'm also sitting here looking at uh, the commitments that basically the city's already made over the next year in the budget. And I think right now I'm coming up with about $71 million. If you're talking about rolling this out to 100 nurses over a three year period, that's about a $7 million uh, price tag. And so now we're, we're up to 74, 75 million next year before we really even start uh, and before we finish this budget. So if it's, if it's critical to me, I think the board it, it needs to sit back down and figure out what the true priorities are. And if it is a true priority, then I think, you know, uh, because if we come in and we give the money for it, we don't have 
we don't have assurances. Now I know you guys will say, yeah, we're going to do it, and you, you will. But we really don't have assurances down the road that that's going to end up happening year in, year out. Uh, and so that's my concern with it. And, and again, I just I always talk pretty direct and, and what I think and what I believe. And so that's my major concern. And I would like, you know, if, if the board feels it's that it's a, that high of a priority, I'd like for them to go back and crunch the numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Um, <coughs> Uh, Council Lady Weiner, did you have yes, a question? Yes. Um, how hard is it to attract school nurses and keep them? <clears throat> I don't know the answer to that question. Definitely, we they they are staffed pretty much fully staffed. Um, there are five or six that are that are basically there for filling in when somebody's ill or, or can't be there for whatever reason. Um, so, I mean, some people prefer a part-time job. They like being on the school calendar. Others wouldn't. Uh, I don't know that it's particularly difficult. I mean, we have issues all the time with that sort of thing. I don't know that it's particularly difficult. But, Council, I think to your point, I think that that's part of why they divided up um, into three years. Um, originally, you know, originally the plan was to do it all in the first year, but because of exactly what you're saying, how difficult it can be, and make sure that we want to get the very best teachers, uh, uh, excuse me, nurses, that's why it was divided up into three years. And so we're looking for 13 that's instead of 40 at one time. And then, um, like uh, Council Lady Blaylock, in that uh, Council it makes sense to explore a relationship with our area nursing schools to see if there's some way, because I know in audiology, when we're getting our doctors, we have to have clock hours, and we have to have the opportunity to go into clinic. And I know when my daughter went to nursing school, she did the same. So maybe there's an opportunity there to capitalize on some of that local need. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Um, I think it's great that we're in the middle of the discussion with school nurses, and I'm glad to see that there's a priority to put nurses in our some of our most you know schools that we have to pray about a little bit more than others. And I appreciate that. Um, but is there a way to make the burden a little easier to cover by partnering with Metro General? I know you do a lot with the health department. But I don't know, and I'm not a doctor or a nurse, so, um, you know, is there a way that, hey, if we, let's say, if we said, hey, could uh, health department provide three or five or whatever numbers of nurses, or can Metro General supplement out? Because I know, I'm not sure, but most kids, at least they're supposed to have some sort of free health insurance or something, you know, while they're enrolled in school, and maybe if General provides some nurses, maybe they could build health insurance you know, or I'm just thinking because, you know, um, always our, our county hospital needs more, you know, patients with insurance. And maybe if uh, they have a nurse that comes to the school every every two weeks or every week or however, or even staff there, you know, maybe that's a way that we could help general at the same time provide the services that your students need. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think we do have some uh, Mark from um, General Hospital, if he could help answer that question too. Well, can, let me invite you up to, to add, add to the discussion. Just have a seat. You, want to? you can sit. Yeah, sure. Uh, the question. So a little, I was having the same problem Tom was. I was hearing sort of bits and pieces. Can you just give me the question? Basically, you know, you have nurses, and you know, I hope that I'm correct that most of the children that attend our metro schools have some sort of insurance. You know, most of it should be free, you know, and you need more clients that can, that you can build their insurance, and you don't charge copays to um, a lot of folks. So since the kids, you know, are kids, they don't have any money, and you know, and you have nurses, and they need nurses, maybe there's a way that the health department, you, and the schools can partner to kind of help save some money, but also provide the funding that the, kid, that the, the health services that the sure. kids need, and also bring some resources into your hospital. Sure, so our 
nurse leadership could also provide uh, supervision. And I know uh, Dr. Joseph has a great relationship with Dr. Webb, so and also with Dr. Paul. So, I mean, I'm happy to sort of run that up the chain. Um, okay. All right. Any any other questions? Yes, Councilman Bennett. How would that work? So that the child that gets hurt in school, they have to show the insurance card. Well, most I'm not sure, but I know you know you have a kid in grade school also. I just I know that they're required, or at least they used to be. I mean, she's been there before Dr. Joseph came in. I know it was required that all kids, or at least my daughter, had health insurance. You know, and we had to show that you know she had health insurance. And when they have it, you know, it's easier. You know, even if it's you know whatever it is for general to bill, because lots of times, you know, which we know our county hospital doesn't turn people away, and most of the clients that come in there don't have insurance, but they're helping our kids, and the kids have insurance, which I, I'm not 100% sure, and, and if you, any of you fine gentlemen can help me, I think there's a policy that covers the kids, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, are, are Metro school students provided health insurance, free health insurance? Uh, Councilman, I believe you're thinking about uh, Tim Care. Tim Care, yeah. Co covers our most vulnerable, you know, some of our most vulnerable yeah. students, but doesn't cover all our students. And Chairman, if I may, I, I think what I, the common theme I hear from council members is they want us to partner with outside agencies and our other partners in the community. We hear that loud and clear. That's why we partner with the health department for exactly the same reasons that you are bringing up. And I think you're encouraging us to look beyond just the health department and see if there's other ways to build some synergy around this. So okay. uh, we agree, health is very needed for our students. Thank you. Uh, other council questions? I know I just, Councilman Glover. Thank you, just answer because Chris, if I remember correctly, uh, that was one of the things that we worked on when I was on the board to make sure we were billing for, for the 10 care Medicaid uh, where we could. It, 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 we did institute that. Am I remembering that correctly? We did the Medicaid reimbursement. Yes. Uh, it took a while for the state to allow that to happen because of the uniqueness of Ten Care, but we have started doing that recently, uh, within the last year or so, with a uh, consulting firm. And so we have started to see some of that come in finally, but that was a long journey, as you remember. Yes. Is there any other option? Is there an availability for students who have private insurance? Is there even an option if it's maintenance, if, like? Uh, with insulin, with, with any type of uh, maintenance medication that they're doing. I mean, is there even an option that, that insurance could be billed for, for services rendered? I, I'm not sure of direct services uh, that can be. My gut tells me no, but I, I mean, I think it'd be worth exploring on that as well. I, I think Tennessee is so unique with Tim here. It's not like other states that where the school districts right. receive pretty hefty reimbursements. Uh, you know, we're always willing to look into you know, possibilities. Other council uh, uh, questions? I, I have a quick question that's useful for me um, going into the weekend. School nurses would be the school system's number one uh, wish list item. I just wanted to confirm yeah. that. And then what would be number two uh, if there is a number two? I mean, is it all on number one that this is the one thing that we can do? That's number two, really I think number two would be the additional support for social emotional learning with the uh, you know the restorative justice and restorative practices within our within our buildings. You know we've been uh, working hard to implement restorative practices, and in our you know original budget proposal, we had talked about adding additional professional development for staff. And now that we've moved into a quadrant uh, model, we were looking at two additional coaches that could provide direct support to schools and be in schools full time, mm -hmm. providing. Uh, that support to uh, counselors and teachers for the social emotional support. Okay, but school nurses, if you had one, that one ask, it'd be school that nurses. Is the ask that you would make of, of yes. the council. Okay, that, that's very, thank you for directly answering that. Any other question from council members? Yeah. Yes, uh, Vice Chair. Dr. Joseph, can you can you expand upon the, the social emotional learning, like how all that ties into like what guidance counselors are? <laughs> I'm not I'm not in that arena and I'm sure. sure many of my colleagues don't understand how all that connects for me in my mind I'm saying if we have guidance counselors right 
why do we need an additional support system when we already have counselors? In, right. in the because like nurses, our guidance counselors are overwhelmed. Uh, they have many more students to um, supervise, and they, they are, as a result, they're handling a lot of the, uh, we don't, they don't, they can't do as much counseling and support directly to students as we would like. Um, when I came in, one of the first things we did was require uh, principals to make sure counselors were freed of the administrative duties uh, that they had had to, to ensure that they could provide direct support. So we've got lots of students that come in and demonstrate uh, behavioral challenges, and uh, teachers need support in knowing how to work with those students within classrooms because we need to you know, keep our kids in class so they can learn, but we got to make sure that when students are in class, they're not disrupting the learning of other students. Uh, and how we discipline students, one of the biggest challenges we have in the district is the disproportionate suspension, particularly of African American, Latino uh, students, students with um, uh, disabilities. And we need to provide training and support to teachers uh, to work with those students. Thank you. thank you. Any further questions? Um, again, thank you for being here. It's useful to know what your number one priority is. And thank you. again, it's, uh, appreciate the dialogue between us and MMPS. Thank, thank you, you so much for your support. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And then our next segment is, is our codes. Uh, thank you very much. So thank you very much for being here again, trying to have a discussion. I think we kept you kind of late uh, a few weeks ago at the council chamber. It's this quite may be all right. easier to, to ask questions around. Codes was clearly a very uh, high priority on the sort of council wish list. And um, a couple of aspects of the questions, again, I know everybody who all have questions. Uh, one aspect of it, though, is uh, fee increases to pay for codes and the requirement of having a study really before you can raise fee that codes, in effect, should pay for itself and to do a study. And so part of when you come around to me, my question is, what, how long does it take to do a study? What needs to be part of that study? What's the funding level required for that study? And what do we need to get out, out of that? But again, it's a strong interest of, of everyone on the council. And with that, um, let's a ask people with questions. Um, we've been starting down on the left here, council ladies. Um, I know a lot of our, our colleagues had um, uh, made some requests um, we see in their budget um, positions related to property standards, um, but did not see reflected their um, requests for zoning examiners. Um, and so, you know, there's kind of a variety, I think, of colleagues of various combinations of property standards uh, and examiners. And I'm kind of trying to think about what's, what's the best combination to help you all meet your needs and uh, so can you speak to that the need for zoning examiners please I can. Specifically, we pointed out a need for two additional zoning examiners. And, and zoning examiners are your first point of contact when you come to the codes department to apply for a permit or to ask a question about a property or what can I do, you know, does the zoning code allow this or allow that? And um, it's, it's, I don't know if I want to say it's overwhelming at this point, but there are lots of things we wish we were doing that we're not doing that we should be doing, like returning phone calls, responding to emails, spending more time with citizens and applicants, um, discussing the complexities of, of the zoning code. Uh, as you know, it's quite complex and uh, there aren't easy answers to what most people think are simple questions. Um, I'm reminded of when Council Lady Murphy asked me one day, what's the rear setback requirement in R20 zoning? And the answer is, I have no idea. 
It depends on where it is. It depends on what kind of street it's on. It depends on what you're proposing to do at the rear of the property. It depends on whether there's any kind of overlay involved. So there are a dozen different variables uh, to any question. So every question is a research project. These two positions would aid us in serving the public and serving uh, permit applicants. The, the truth is uh, a lot of that, a lot of those questions got answered uh, by Brandon when he was at the front desk at the zoning de uh, planning department and Brandon now works for you. Uh, and most of those questions fell to the codes department when he joined uh, the council staff. Uh, you may have a follow-on question. Oh, yes, I guess, can you, I mean, can you speak to the weight in development services, how many zoning so examiners you have now, you know, how, how that's running? I, mean, I, I have a sense sometimes in engaging there um, that, with all due respect, that, you know, there's some things that are slipping through the cracks um, mm -hmm. at that zoning examiner level, and I think that's just because of the, the volume of what they're dealing with and the pressure that they're under. Wait time there, and um, you know what when your examiners are working with someone, how that process is working based on current staffing. Um, yes, the um, um, currently staffed at six uh, zoning examiners. The uh, sixth one is a new position. Um, we we had added in the pre prior year's budget. Um, we began. To a process to fill that position only to have someone retire and had to fill it again so uh, we're constantly working towards keeping our uh, employment levels up but today we have five examiners uh, and one in training one recent hire who we would not turn loose with the general public or the applicants he's pretty much in training at this point, or she's in training. Thank you. Any further questions? Well, I guess just your, your wait time I had asked in development services somebody needs to be. Yeah, and it's, um, they're serving right now an average of 65 customers a day. Uh, an average of 20 minutes is spent with each customer. Um, we average four and a half zoning examiners per day to serve those customers. Uh, and the zoning examiners spending 4.8 hours per day serving those customers in the QList system who have signed in to be seen. The balance of their time, uh, roughly three hours, is spent on e-permits, web permits, dropping off plans, uh, applications for multiple permits. One applicant may one applicant may bring you 20 permit applications and you have to get it set up and then you cookie cutter 19 more after you do the first one. Meanwhile, the, the public is waiting out in the front room for their turn. Um, and then after our walk-in customers, some folks come in late, board of zoning appeal applications, um, and returning their phone calls and responding to emails. And it's the phone calls and the emails that typically typically get shorted. Thank you. Um, coming down this side of the table, uh, Councilman Bedney, uh, Chairman Allen. Yeah, I, I want to go back to the, the wait time. The way I understand that works, I mean, we had been shown some screenshots that showed like five hour wait time, but that's not, you have to sit here for five hours it's you sign in online and then it tells you to come five hours later. Can you sort of explain how that process works? Correct. The software is good. Our customers like it, the QList system. Uh, prior to just signing in on a clipboard, sitting down in our lobby and waiting for an unknown amount of time, uh, the QList system lets you sign in electronically and gives you, a, it tells you where you are in line and about how long you're going to be in line. Now, the time they're giving you is inaccurate, okay? That's, that's a known. Uh, most of our customers will tell us if it says four hours, you can plan on two. Um, so the, 
the reason, and I've been trying to dig down into why does it give you an inaccurate number if we've got a, uh, uh, a system that's supposed to be able to do that, and it's, it's not the software, it's the way we use it. Because we allow customers to request a particular uh, zoning examiner. And we have zoning examiners who are assigned a specialty uh, as in Clint Harper is assigned to short-term rental properties. Everybody can't keep up with every iteration of that, but Clint can. So he is the go-to expert within the group. So they'll, they'll come in and they'll sign in and they can request a particular applicant, which means when their name is called, if Clint is not the one calling them up, they're gonna continue to wait. So the, it, it distorts um, the uh, the software and the result is it gives you a, a fairly wild number for the estimated wait time. You know your place in line, that's accurate. The wait time is inaccurate, but what it also does is periodically send you text messages giving you updates and it'll give you a text message warning um, that your name is about to be called. You're 10 minutes or 20 minutes out. So it's much more predictable. You, you still have to wait, you just don't have to wait Later. at the coach department. Okay. Thank you, Thank you uh, Council Lady. Um, around the table, Councilman um, Clover. Okay, so the $828,000, was that originally requested in the uh, budget that you uh, asked the mayor for? Yes. Okay, and it was how many positions? Nine, was it nine positions? Mm -hmm. Nine. Okay, of those two would be zoning inspectors, uh, be put into the zoning? It would be, uh, there was two zoning examiners, one plans examiner, and then a group of trade inspectors, two electrical, two mechanical, and two plumbing. Okay, all right. So that, that request was originally made, all right. Uh, if we are able to fund this, because, and I, I think Chairman is correct if I'm wrong, I think you said that that's a high priority for most all of us. Yeah. Uh, so they because, got that. So, so they got the, here's, the state uh, and I know that the, the, uh, the suggestion is made yeah. possibly a little bit higher B. I think if you had a $15 million dollar department work on the city, quite a bit of money, maybe for fees are high enough, I think maybe if, if, this was a private operation and we were generating that kind of money and we were making people wait as long as they're having to, then we'd go out of business. And so I think we, we need to prioritize and give the money here and, and, and the staffing to where the people are not having to wait. Because uh, I, know, I know you guys are overwhelmed. I mean, I, I, I come down there too, I see the lines and, and everything else. So I hope that we do make it a priority. Uh, I, you know, because I think that's probably the number one complaint I don't want to speak on everybody's behalf. That's the number one complaint I get. Uh, and so um, I, I certainly think from my standpoint, it is uh, a major priority in the zoning piece of it as, as well, the um, zoning examiners. So uh, it, if, if you get this, do you feel confident that the efficiency in the office will increase drastically? Uh, and then I, the, my, uh, so I'll let you answer, answer that question and then I want to come back to the short-term rentals very quickly. Yeah, I think she will, it will improve dramatically, drastically. I, I'm not sure what's the right term, but um, I would also say that uh, with, with the addition of all that we've talked about, we're still a pretty lean operation uh, in comparison with any other major city you want to compare us to. You might find that we're staffed at about 50% or maybe uh, less of what uh, other staffs uh, would uh, typically be. So we try to keep it lean. We try to keep it on the efficient side. And, and it's reflected in, if you look at our revenues uh, this year, about $21.5 million in revenues, primarily from permit fees, $21.5 million. And I think our uh, budget this year was $8.8 .8 million. Uh, we're going to come in with a surplus of uh, 12.6 million over the cost of operations. Uh, so sorry, I was thinking around 15, but that's that. Yeah. But but still, that's that's a nice surplus right. uh, that I think the city's receiving. All right. The, the second question, 
the other complaints, not in my district, but I, I see the emails from various other districts on the STRPs, the, the Friday night parties, the Saturday night parties. Um, the one thing that disturbed me is when I asked where was it in the budget uh, on that software, um, nobody was able to tell me until I think it was Zach and my Zach came over and said, no, no, it was over here. That that bothered me a little bit. That why why your finance department didn't know where that money was. Where are we in the process on that? And what um, what exactly is that going to accomplish as we try to as we try to haggle out the STRPs on, on where we try to land or where the state says we're going to land or however this is going to end up working out? Where are we with that? And by exercising this, where will the efficiency happen there? Uh, on stopping the the Friday nights, the Saturday nights, the the neighbors, and uh, the bad apple uh, okay. category of that uh, uh, arena. Okay. Well, all of all of the um, <coughs> consultants' recommendations uh, were recommended by the mayor. They're part of her recommended budget to the council. Um, the as far as the question on the amount for the uh, uh, software consulting, uh, that that's on me. Uh, I stumbled on that question when you asked it at the budget hearing, uh, but the finance department knew exactly where it was, okay? And it's, it's in the capital budget, uh, not the operating budget. And I, I believe it's gonna come from, I believe it's coming from 4% funds, but it, it's on that side, not the operating side of the budget. Uh, the status of that, coincidentally, is we put out an RFP um, and we had several people submit and it was evaluated by a committee. Uh, there was um, a vendor selected. The, sel the one selected uh, was host compliance. Uh, the one that we originally presented to you back in February, I believe. Um, they were found to present the best solution uh, by the evaluation committee. Uh, there was a protest filed uh, the protest was heard and uh, they filed an appeal and the appeal was heard and the purchasing agent was upheld. So as of <laughs> yesterday, um, we were cleared to enter into the contract with host compliance. That's a big part of the short-term rental property solution. How long will it take to implement? Now, now, that it's, now that it's been awarded, how long will it take us to be up and operational with that? I, I read through their their um, proposal uh, on the RFP, and it there's a uh, a schedule in there, and I believe it's within one week. There are some of signing the contract. There are a few deliverables, and and we share information with them. They share information with us. Within two to three weeks, they're giving us lists of non-complying properties. Uh, somewhere in the four to six week range. Uh, it's at full operation. So then before the summer is out, we're going to have a good sampling. So uh, I'm talking about our highest tourist you know, visitation time. We're going to have a pretty good sampling of, of what the software can do then? Correct. And they're going to assist us by sending out notice letters, uh, the department's notice letters. The initial boilerplate letter would be sent out on our letterhead on our behalf by our uh, consultant. And uh, it would it would promptly get underway. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Council members. Any further questions? Yes, Councilman Davis. Oh, Mina. I'm sorry, didn't see your hand. Thank you, uh, Director Cobb. Um, on your original, uh, I'm kind of late getting into the real number. So, on your original proposal. I think, uh, let's see, increase trade inspectors. So you are asking uh, 669.900, 669,900. And then your budget was uh, allocated to 74,000. Could you tell me about that, your proposal and 74,000? I think you asked was 669,900, but you are rewarded uh, 74,000. You asked for 10 FTE, but you are rewarded one FTE. I'm not. I'm not following you. 
Is there a, a budget page you're yes, looking uh, at? Is there a page number? Uh, maybe not only a big budget. I've got this coming from uh, Department Code Administration uh, to increase in trade, uh, in increase in trade inspector. Yes. And you asked for 10 FTE and. Oh, okay. Are you on page G33-3? She's actually on a budget yeah, modification. Yeah, I'm on a budget document. modification. It's not in there, but, yeah. but the question was during the, the hearings um, with the right. mayor, you, you asked for, uh, they asked about any modifications in the budget, and you requested 10 trade inspectors to be added. That was the request. Right. <clears throat> okay, so let me ask you no, <laughs> another I, question. I, I requested six trade trades inspectors. Okay, so in other words, you got what you all requested because another one is, uh, let's see, you re request six, uh, six FTE, that and was budget is 876300 and you got all six as you asked. That was property. That's property. property. That's property. That's property. property. That's property. That's property. Right. That's six that's property that's standards, standards inspectors. Right. But I, what I'm asking is, it says trade inspectors. So mm -hmm. that's the word. It was mm -hmm. correct. So that's the one you have not that's got. That's what we're asking for. Right. The, they were not included in the mayor's recommended budget. Right. So that so include a joining examiner and so forth. Correct. <clears throat> so you said uh, wait time is improved uh, due to software. Uh, and text message and so forth. And on your end, you try to improve uh, how to serve customer. And Correct. I think it, you will see, seeing a little result. Uh, but could you tell me how many of your zoning examiner is getting close to retirement age or may take early retirement if they have a chance? We, we have two zoning examiners, sen senior level type examiners that have been with us for quite a few years. Um, um, one has probably been with the department 35 years. The other has been with the department 28 years. Um, and, and they could retire, you know, at any time. Um, I'm not sure uh, one of them still, even though he's been there 35 years, I'm not sure his age is quite where it needs to be. But sometime in the next couple of years, I would expect to lose them both and uh, to to retirement, and uh, that's going to create quite a uh, quite a gap for us. So we we do need to get new people up to speed as right. quickly as we can. So going back to your original statement, because. Setback in R20 is as easy as I used to because it depending on the location, depending Correct. on the policy, depending on which street and so forth. So by losing those institutional knowledge in 28 years, 30 years, and replacing somebody young, how long will it take for those new examiner to come up to the speed? Well, it. We, we believe it takes us at least six months just to get a newly hired uh, zoning examiner up to speed where they can wait on the next customer in line. Uh, they can field uh, and, and begin the process on about any type of permit application or question and, and recognize when they're over their head so that they get it to a person who can assist. Uh, obviously, we have a chief zoning examiner, we have a zoning administrator, we have some senior level people that can uh, assist in the more difficult uh, questions. Uh, but six months to 12 months uh, to get pretty good at what you're doing, uh, to get to the level of the two that might be retiring, it'll probably take two or three years uh, to get them to be proficient at that level. 
And so in your department, you have zoning examiner and also property standard inspector. Mm -hmm. So zoning examiners are the one bringing the revenue. So by uh, having additional examiner, um, maybe be able to uh, review the plan a little bit quicker or provide better customer service, maybe your Correct. level of service will increase Correct. dramatically. Yes. Um, thank you. And another thing I would like to ask is, I think uh, short-term rental or property standards, you know, because we are um, a complaint-driven department. So, but sometimes, you know, if uh, your inspector works only nine to five, you may not be able to really catch the actual complaint. Mm -hmm. Is there any like a shift for the property standard inspector? And, and I'll go back to the, the recommendations from the consultants mm -hmm. uh, were to um, employ a software or a consultant that could assist by giving us a 24-7 hotline, mm -hmm. and that's in the contract. So there would be a 24-7 hotline that any neighbor to a short-term rental property could contact, and the operator answering the phone, a, a, a human voice, would answer the phone and respond and look up that particular property. If it is uh, permitted as short-term rental, they would immediately then contact the owner of that property and, and give that owner 30 minutes to correct the issue. And then they would contact the person who called in the complaint to see if it had been taken care of. Uh, the other thing, the um, consultant had recommended is that we look at having uh, property standards inspectors who are on call, not assigned shifts. They specifically recommended against that, but recommended that we have someone on call. Uh, similar to how we handle emergency electrical reconnect permits, uh, we have an electrical inspector on call 365 days of the year. Um, and responds after hours if there's a thunderstorm that knocks out power or a, um, you know, an automobile runs through a bank building, uh, those types of calamities, we've got somebody available that they can speak with and coordinate that with NES and, and the contractors. So those uh, after hours uh, person, mm -hmm. on-call person is by assigning some special person will be available Correct. That yep. extra That's our intent. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you for coming, gentlemen. Um, good question. Um, I feel, and this is my personal opinion, but if you can look at it, I think we need to raise the fees. I know we may not be able to raise the fees for the BZA submission, because I know that you have two senior employees that are spending a lot of their time. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think you guys recently had your first 10 o'clock at night meeting. You got a busy end of that long. You know, and it's quite unusual, but because of the amount of work. So, A, can we increase the fees for submitting an application for the BZA? And then, two, can we increase the permit fees? I would. Regarding fees, uh, we haven't raised them in quite a few years, 10 or 12 years. Um, we currently are collecting more than the cost of the service, so I think if you bring a consultant in to look at it, they're going to recommend a decrease in the fees that are being charged because the service doesn't uh, come anywhere close to approaching that level. Um, so we haven't asked. Um, I think that uh, the fees can be adjusted by the council. You've got the full right to do that. You set the fees and you can reduce them. And we've always gone through a process of bringing a consultant in, comparing our fees to the cost for full cost recovery. Uh, state law clearly allows us to recover 100% of our cost. Um, and we compare our fees to jurisdictions around us to make sure we're in balance in our Middle Tennessee area and that our fees are consistent with the fees charged by other major cities, our peer cities. Um, 
those places like Charlotte and Austin and Louisville and Birmingham, uh, Tampa, Florida. And so we do that type of evaluation and then we look at a number of different types of permits. So it's not just, you know, it's, it's how much is a permit fee? Well, it depends on what you're wanting to build. There's residential fees and commercial fees and how the schedule is created and plan review fees. And we take a, a, a good long look at that and generally follow the consultant's recommendations. Um, that would be the process I would recommend again if the council wants to pursue that. Um, I'm, you know, personally, and it may or may not be the right thing to do, but I feel if we can raise the fees, we can fund more, help you fund more inspectors, mm -hmm. and help, you know, alleviate some of the burden and provide a better customer service. You know, of course, I want to help you get your, your, your new crop coming in this budget. Okay. You know, but I want to make sure that we can fund other th other things in the future instead of attacking Joe taxpayers' pockets. Um, but, and I wouldn't really want to hire a consultant because I feel that instead of paying them to study this, we can have them study something else. When if we we're going to raise a BZA fee, 15 bucks or 25 bucks, to help cover the cost of an additional inspector or an electrical examiner. You know, I feel that's just a win-win because then the developers and the people remodeling don't have to keep waiting because I think um, Doug Cleves might be close to retirement. I know Doug does a lot of those. Oh, he's, he's already gone? gone. He's wow. Already. wow. Yeah. So, we definitely, so you definitely need a, another mechanical inspector soon. We're happily advertised. Absolutely. We're, we're looking for in the process okay. of hiring the replacement. So, so Mike, Mike, we can raise, the council can choose to raise the fees? Council can raise fees, but it has to be based on the actual costs. When Mr. Cobb said uh, it's actually 100% right that they're entitled to collect 100% of the costs, but not 101. So anything above the actual costs is deemed a tax, and we don't have that authority. Yeah, but when we raid the fees, you know, your staff weren't staying there until 10 o'clock at night, you know, listening to short term permit rentals and party houses and things like that. So even though the employees are great, you know, their salary, so they'll stay until midnight. But I'm sure, you know, it's, you know, taking a toll on them a little bit probably. They're just probably just too nice to, to mention okay. it. <clears throat> Thank you, Councilman. Uh, any following questions by council members? Uh, um, um, Vice Chair? So, um, from my notes from um, the hearing in the chamber. I have property standards staggering. I don't know if that was a, a note to myself to ask you or if you mentioned that in, in, the, in the hearing uh, as it relates to um, what we're having, the issues in the neighborhoods is we have neighbors that violate um, after um, operating hours or property, mm -hmm. property and standards inspectors. So they're ne they're never able to to catch the offender parking on the grass in the evening or parking in the grass on on the weekend and i have a note about staggering uh part-time and weekend i don't know if we discussed that or if that was my little note to myself to to suggest yeah we we talked about that some in the okay. budget hearing and uh i i said that, that the consultants who came in and their specific recommendation was that we not staff okay. not at stagger. nights and weekends okay. um, and and staggering to where they overlap a little bit they they talked about well maybe we could have some staggered shifts where they work till you know seven o'clock or eight o'clock or something like that not didn't get in late evening or wee hours of the morning uh, but then you got to deal with rush hour traffic and I, I know if I'm if I hear about something going on out in, in Antioch and I leave the office at rush hour, it may take me uh, an hour or more to get there. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I know it, I drove from uh, the health department to Donaldson one day and I was, uh, it was Council incredible to me, an hour and 45 minutes, you know, uh, just to drive home. So, um, and I live seven miles from my office, so. Uh, so, so what would be what would be the solution? Because if I if if I if if a neighbor reports mm -hmm. um, another neighbor parking on the grass, 
and they work all day. They work from 8 to 5, and they're only violating from 5 until 5 p.m. until they go to work the Correct. next day. It becomes an endless cycle of reporting because when the, when the property inspector go out, they don't see anyone parking on the grass, so they close the case. Correct. So the property owner comes home again. Neighbor reports them again. It just becomes an endless Correct. cycle, and it's not efficient for it for our property standards. And, and we, we have keep going uh, through this visual. This it's, it's just a continuing cycle. We do have uh, inspectors that go out nights and weekends. But you have and to request make them. I'm told you have to request them. The flex team. Oh, yeah, I, any council member makes yeah. a request of us to do that, we get it on the list and we do go out and, and make inspections at night and on weekends. That is correct. I don't give people that permanent assignment in hours, but we do get out there uh, to follow up on those things, those repeat type violations. So is the flex team solely for evenings and weekends? No, the, the flex team, all of our inspectors are assigned by geographic territory. They're assigned to a geographical area uh, and they take complaints in that geographical area and they work proactively in that geographical area. Um, the, um, uh, the other thing they do with the flex team is we assign them specific projects not a geographical area. So if we want to do an audit in a particular area of town, we want to get additional manpower, uh, the flex team is going to handle it. It's just like the flex team at the police department uh, handles uh, getting additional manpower to an area or to an assignment. If we want to look at all of the signs on all of the thoroughfares in the county, we'll turn that over to our flex team. And they'll go door to door, street by street, from downtown to the county line and back and do sign code enforcement. And they may be on that project for several weeks. Uh, that type of assignment is what we have them doing. So if the flex team, uh, Director Cobb, if the flex team, if their project for the county is on signage, right, they're, they're, they're tied up with signage. We still have this void of evening violators and weekend violators that's not being addressed while our flex team is tied up doing doing the project for signage. No, we do signs, but that's just one project we do. I was we, just using that as an example yeah, we, to, to illustrate the, the, yeah. the gap in service. Uh, out of any given year, that probably represents uh, three to six weeks of their time. Um, but we have rental inspection districts where the council has mapped out certain areas of the county for us to examine door to door, street by street. Um, and the flex team is given that assignment. So, I was told y'all don't do that anymore. Well, we, we do audits and, uh, we've, we've done okay. audits. I know uh, about the audits, you, I'm talking about the rental inspection yeah. districts. Yeah, but we do, uh, the rental inspection districts really need to be looked at again. Okay. I think I think this. Um, I would suggest that um, we look at mapping number of complaints, crime statistics, age of housing stock. Uh, we go back to the uh, nexus that that we had looked at for mapping the original rental inspection districts, mm -hmm. but but the nation's isn't the same neighborhood that it was ten years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, Germantown and Salem Town aren't the same neighborhood they were 10 or 15 years ago. So we need to look and find out where uh, our hot zones are. And, and I think we've got a pretty good idea where they are. You're talking uh, to one. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That your district is, uh, <laughs> does have at, at one or more. Um, and we need to redirect those flex team assets to those areas, but the consultant's report actually recommended that we eliminate the flex team and merge them back into the uh, geographical assignments mm -hmm. and and work proactive, more proactively within the assigned geographical districts. So um, we've got some decisions to make um, along those lines. So would it, would it be beneficial for us to consider 
uh, a part-time weekend property standards. <coughs> I'm asking for your your expertise. I mean, it's, it's I, your show. I would not recommend it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Council Lady Bailey. So along those lines, to get a constituent calls in to make a complaint, do they? Um, people receiving the phone call, do they ever ask them, is this only at night as far as parking on the grass or things that typically are just a nighttime complaint? Do they Are they educated enough to ask that question and then you know, get that assigned to a potential flex team or somebody that could go out on the night and again? I, I, I don't know the answer. Okay. Uh, I would think so, but uh, I don't know it for a fact. And how about our um, online um, complaint, the new system? Mm -hmm. Is there a box to check for a nighttime inspection? Don't know that no. either. The answer is no. Right. Yeah. Okay. And I just wanted to say I like the flex team, so if you don't get rid of that. <laughs> yeah. may have somewhat to just answer. Uh, what I was going to ask you is with the new software, if you have recurring incidents uh, of parking on the grass or whatever the, the violation happens to be, and it's occurring in the evening when you don't, when you can't get somebody from downtown to Antioch or downtown to Hermitage or Bellevue or wherever it happens to be, is there the uh, opportunity for an individual to take a picture of that where it's clearly identifiable that to that piece of property and upload it to the software where you've got some uh, where you have a trail of evidence yeah but it it'd be a photo right. of the problem we get a lot of photos uh but that doesn't represent evidence that okay. could be admitted in yeah, court as in court evidence should we prosecute okay. that's why i'm asking uh, the question yeah. please yeah. Um, just just a, an update and and uh some folks that have been working even more diligently on the, the new hub program can can correct me if I'm incorrect. But uh, I know that we're rolling out public works first and trying to get that underway and eventually into the codes. But um, at some point, I would say in the next three years, I guess would be a reasonable estimate, there will be an, a mobile opportunity to be able, whenever you see a problem, you take a picture, it'll geotag it, and it'll go to the proper department anybody that's online will be able to see whether or not it's already been reported or not and what phase it's in as to the response and um, what's next and i think that to me that's been the, uh, one of the number one thing is that i know it's it's that darn due process right it's like at what at what point are we in the complaint and if we can figure out a way to make the constituent be able to have access to that information i think it will reduce Quite a bit of the headache and I, that we're experiencing. And I believe the coach department is probably next in line uh, to be to work on that's the right. hub. That's right. That's how I understand it. So I think right. we'll be we'll see that happen next year, and then probably the mobile application in the mm -hmm. following year. Things that's, always take longer than so what clarify I clarify that for the viewing audience to make sure that they don't think that this is happening. Yeah, it'll be yeah. it'll be another two or three years, but we are in the, absolutely in a process, and um, yeah, we're and, trying to discuss those. Three to yeah. five. Um, we'll hear more about that as it's as it's available. Thank you, Council Lady. Uh, Councilman? Yeah, I, uh, when we started thinking about the code school, uh, I spent time meeting with uh, the environmental court judge because, and this is something I want to bring into your attention. I mean, there's so much we can ask codes to do. Uh, if we don't have also the environmental court judge and the rest of the system working together, then uh, we hit a wall. So. Just like he was saying, the picture is not evidence. I mean, the, the, the judge is the person that decides how to enforce that uh, what is reported by, by the guys that are working at code. So uh, maybe we should at some point have a meeting and bring everybody that really makes the system work around the table and figure out how to do this. Uh, we passed the legislation about the uh, code school and a year later, uh, I got a call about uh, implementing. So uh, the, the idea is that we may have the best ideas, but if they are not going to be implemented, they they may not do what we intend to do. So um, 
you know that we uh, we really count on you, uh, but also understand that uh, you are uh, part of a bigger system. I want to take this opportunity to thank you for answering my letter. Uh, I I have been I had got calls from other council members asking me to translate. Uh, like Kenny Johnson once calls me, it's like I have this person here uh, as. Uh, this code problem. Can you please tell them, uh, educate this person about this code issue? So I end up being the de facto translator for the council members, and uh, I'm, I'm asking that. Uh, and I appreciate you are eager to hire uh, inspectors that are from the different communities, so we can really do that work of educating people on what the rules are and how to uh, be good neighbors. So I appreciate you uh, yeah, making you. that commitment. I'm glad to know you're Thank you. Uh, any uh, other? I yes. One. Uh, one more, Director Cobb. Have we turned off the voicemail? I mean, y'all don't return the calls. I would rather, if a constituent calls, they get a fast busy as opposed to <coughs> leaving a voicemail and they never receive a follow up. Can we just turn off the voicemail and let Are it Are you get? asking if we can? Yes. The, or the have you? Voicemail is alive and well. Um, okay. But no one's okay. returning the calls. Okay. Let me know who's not returning. Okay. 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 Any, any further questions? Uh, I had a quick question for you as to the, you were talking about the consultant. Your estimated cost and the time that it would take to do a consultant study would be what? In terms of uh, preparation for, to any kind of fee increase? For a fee increase, I would We've we've gone done it a couple of times in in my tenure with Metro, and uh, my recollection is it takes three to six months to do it, and it costs fifty to sixty thousand. Yeah, but this was this was back in two thousand nine, I believe. It was about okay. fifty five thousand then. And it took about yeah. four and a half five months. And that was know. the last time that fees were increased. Two thousand three and in two thousand nine, I believe. Were in two thousand nine. Whatever. Both based on similar studies. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I might add that, yes. that typically the fee studies uh, typically take place when the economy is at the bottom and fees are low and we're concerned that they will, the revenues will dip below the, uh, the cost of operations. Right. And, and the result is times improve and revenues go out through the roof and our uh, cost of operations stays pretty constant. So, and right now he's collecting more. Yeah. And, okay. and it will happen again. And it will happen again. <laughs> Thank you, Director. I appreciate it. No further questions here. I uh, appreciate you being here, Thank and we're we'll, um, grateful for your time. And then we'll ask him about what his priority would be in the scheme. Oh, well, uh, would, would you ask? Uh, one quick question uh, from the vice chairman. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is my last question. Okay. We've heard too much. So, in prioritizing, uh, to help us prioritize the, the wish list, Director Cobb, can you express which would be your 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 top priority that you didn't get? Um, I think our highest priority, if I could, if I could make number one would be the mechanical inspectors, and number two would be the electrical inspectors, because these are public safety issues that we're talking about. We're talking about giving a uh, a gas mechanical inspector five minutes on a job site instead of 15 to 20 that he really needs, or uh, an electrical inspector gets five minutes to look at an electrical system that's pretty complex instead of a half hour or a couple of hours that he really needs. So uh, the staffing there needs to be addressed. Okay. Uh, plumbing would be probably third. Uh, but those, the trades inspectors would be my highest priority. Trade inspectors. Okay, thank you, Councilman. Let me just say, Director Wall, I appreciate it. I think all the positions you expressed with the zones, the, the zoning piece, those, those two positions, from the complaints I hear, uh, I, I think, let me just emphasize, I think those are high priorities. Uh, and so, uh, hmm. simply from a time standpoint, so I, I hope those are included in, in that as well. So, thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. And again, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the last question. Um, 
All right, I appreciate everybody being here. We are going to try to keep to a schedule. Um, and the next phase of the meeting is the wish, sort of the wish list discussion. Um, thank you, Director. Um, I appreciate everybody being here. And there are our results from our kind of survey of council members on the wish list. And as we go through the highest ranked items that were on the wish list, um, please let's talk about them as we come into the weekend. Um, the DA salary equalization received the most, the most points. Um, there is a complexity in the DA salary. Did, did you? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And Thank we you, we have our our umpire Thank here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, we have our umpire here, um, and and it was decisively the highest item. Um, the DA salaries increase has a complexity to it. By state law, the public defenders have to receive seventy five percent of the <coughs> amount of money that you are are giving to the DA's office. So, it it adds to a complexity um, and to, to be addressed. Um, but again, as with limited resources, as we come down our priorities, I wanted again to, to yes, Councilman, you, I see your puzzle. You, will you clarify the 75%? So is it based upon what they get today or is it new money they would receive? Well, and I've been asked by Channel 3, Ms. Talia and Zach, if you all would come up so that they, in terms of your answer, you could be on the, on the audio. Um, our wonderful finance director has been working hard on this issue today. Chair. Chair. Oh, yes. Is there a way we could get a list of the rankings? Do you have them oh, the available? rankings? Well, we are, we'll, we'll just, we'll go over it as they could come up. But it, it's, it was decisively in the lead uh, for the DA salaries. And we'll go through the, the next seven. Okay. Um, and then the others are kind of clumped together without any decisive uh, okay. scoring advantage. Sounds but again, good. just to address the number one on DA salaries, thank you, Director. Yeah. Uh, I'm not the lawyer in the room, but uh, I've been uh, educated on this requirement. There is a state law and an accompanying uh, Tennessee attorney, attorney General opinion, which says, it basically says, any increase in appropriations for the DA, and that includes salary and office expenses, has to be accompanied by at least a, an amount equal to 75% of that appropriation for the public defender's office. And it does not describe what that money needs to be used for, but it uh, does require that um, you provide that funding to them. So if you gave the DA $100,000, then you would need to give the public defender $75,000. So it makes more expensive whatever funding you <coughs> ultimately give to the, to the DA's office. Um, and yes, and I've and I've shared that. Yeah, you know, I don't know if Mike Jamison wants to jump in, but I've shared that with him as well in terms of the. I, I would just like for him to concur well, his get, understanding of that. It's a one-sentence statute. It says exactly that. There are four uh, attorney general opinions on it. Uh, only one is really specific to our situation and makes it clear that it's mandatory. Um, mm -hmm. The only out that that AG opinion offers is that um, simply because you've allocated the funds to the public defender does not mean they need to spend them, but that doesn't help you on the allocation side. Mm -hmm. So let me, yeah, let me just run that real quick here. Yeah. Okay. So the DA in the upcoming budget was 8913000 mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, public defender is 8287 so it's 93%. So where are we running into a, where, where is this 75% coming into play? It, uh, because it has to do with the increase in the budget. And what has happened in the past, we have provided additional funding to the public defender, so we are above that threshold, but we still have to meet that minimum requirement regarding that 75%. So for Mr. any uh, improvements. So, Mr. Jamison? Yes, sir. 
Uh, if we're already funding it at a 93% level, basically, how... It's about new money. Yes, it doesn't matter what you've been given. Yeah, I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to argue. Yeah. Well, so, so if they want $700,000, we are going to have to give $1.2. We're so, so yes. given that, there are a couple of options to, to, talk, to talk over in this group. One is, can we do it all in one year? Does it need to be yeah. over two years? Um, and then secondly, if you're funding the public defender's office, there is probably a, you, though they're, they're very worthy, there is also possibly a use, since it doesn't have to be spent there, to fund a public defender, JFON PIP, uh, with some of that 75 percent that would have to roll over in fact doing immigration and uh, outreach and defense outreach through this mechanism which will by law really be seems like it's required for us to do as we as we fund this number one priority again I want to bring this up for general discussion I know chairman Allen had a had her hand well, up. Yes, ma'am. My, my memory is that the whole reason this came up is because the public defenders got raises and yes. the DAs did not, and so they're behind. And this was just asking to level the playing field. Yeah. And so matter. I guess my question would be from a legal, legal perspective, does that increase? Does it matter? I mean, the fact that it they got an increase last system. year doesn't count. Is that, it, does it say per year in the same year? Does it say it has to be simultaneously? Any increase in local funding for positions or office expenses for the district attorney general shall be Any. accompanied by an increase in funding of 75% of the increase in funding to the office of public defender. And so the public defender happened last year. I mean, what does the company mean? Did they specifically say in the same year? Is there a definition for a company that makes it have to be absolutely That's distinct? the way it's been construed. Construed by attorney general. By the attorney general. Have they ever asked the question of if we did it ahead of time? Does that count? Has that question ever been answered? Do we do we dare <laughs> wait and let the attorney general answer that question? Mm -hmm. No. Well, we had some public okay. uh, counsel. Yeah. You're essentially talking about an additional five hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Yes. Mm -hmm. if, if, you if you were to fund, somebody's going to say whole thing. If you were to fund the whole thing. On top of the seven sixty. On top Correct. of the seven. Yes. Yes. About another five thirty. So. Okay. Um, so again, for, for this discussion, and I'm listening to every word, there are strategies for maybe not doing the whole thing and for trying to have some of the public defender's money have another mm -hmm. very worthy community use. And uh, yes, Councilman Cholman. I guess the question is, uh, have we had any, have we had discussions with the public defender's office? I mean, we know what the statute says. We know what we're trying to do. We can, if we don't have the money to do the whole thing, we may have to do part of it. But I guess the question is, um, have we dealt with the public defender's office to make sure that uh, if we appropriate money to them, that we actually know what they're going to do with it? Well, um, I know uh, both our finance director and our council has been in touch with them today as this issue really showed up, I guess, in focus just, just yesterday. Well, I'm, I'm sure they're. I'm sure they're pleased to know that we're looking at this now. Uh, but the question is, uh, obviously, there wasn't. I don't think there was anything on the wish list for them. If we're going to take care of the DAs, we follow the state law. Well, well, what sort we, of in in this group of other things was this idea uh, that was on the wish list of again immigration outreach and legal defense uh, for immigrants. So that that would that would fit to some degree if we were in effect obligated to fund uh, public defense money and then again the defender's office in JFON ha has a PIP before I don't think it was necessarily included in the administration's PIP list but it would be an opportunity to increase the funding of PIP of that PIP program and again that was pretty well thought out and and well planned in in the mayor's program would um, hmm. In order to fund the PIP program, would would that require full the full nine hundred thousand, or would we do it kind of in well, segments and do? Well, the PIP funding would count against the public defender's amount, I believe. Right. But are we fund the PIP? was $150,000. So I guess he's suggesting to use that to partially offset any requirement that you may have to fund the public defender. No. No. But, it, oh, it counts yeah. 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 It, it helps me to get yeah. a historical perspective on things. Was it against state law 
last year when they raised the Oh, I understand the, that. The district attorney's office increase. When we increase the district attorney's office, then we have to give the money also to the public defender. Correct. I think last year. We so I'm, I'm trying to figure out why did that happen? Why was it in reverse? And all of the money that was given to the public defender's office was given. Right. That, yeah, please. I can answer Thank that. Thank you, director. They, they ended up with a larger amount of money because of the pay plan recommendations. So when the pay plan recommendations came in, um, they did make those recommendations to increase those salaries for those uh, staff. So they received a larger share of the pay plan allocation dollars, which increased their percent as compared to the DA. So did they realize when they made that recommendation that it was going to skew it? No, and no one was really looking at it from that perspective because it was just a pay plan issue. Oh, that, that so concerns kind of me. I mean, because you have to look at it all. You have to look at the impact and not just make it a decision on one end without realizing what the impact is going to be on the other end because that's why we're at this particular place. Also, I, I do think that uh, if we don't have the funds, that we should do it incrementally to, especially to those who are more seasoned than others, those who's been without that fund. Right. Um, well, again, I defer to the director and Mr. Jamison. I think if you give the money to the district attorney's office, we're not really able to craft who it would go to other than general salary increase. It's a great question. That is correct. As an elected official, he would have that discretion. Okay. He the public defender. I think his question was, would the DA be able to decide yeah, how in, to in spread of, that? Uh, and the answer to that is yes. Does it go to more experienced <laughs> attorneys or okay, is it I'm a sorry, recruitment, a a recruitment tool for newer attorneys? Thank you. Uh, chairman? Right, chairman? Chairman? I, I think fundamentally we all want to, to support the, the DA's office, but um, given that that the dynamics are what they are. This just opens up a, a much larger conversation that this is really needs to be driven on the state level. It's the state law that's really causing the, the, the inequity. I mean, we can do something to, to minimize it short term, but at the end of the day, it's still gonna be that inequity in the salaries there between the public defender's office and the DA's office. Um, Cause he's gonna continue to hire, um, we won't be able to keep pace um, with, with the new hires that he's going to get if we're going to do it incrementally. Yeah. Council Lady. Yeah. The inequity was supposed to be addressed by the fact in an ideal world we would have raised the salaries of the DAs and thus correspondingly had to raise the salaries of the public defender. The right, law was set up law, in such a way, the, yeah. but apparently yeah. this city did it backwards. Because usually in and cities they raise the DA salaries more than the PD. Where right. Which is why the state law came into Right. Right. So where last year in the process, I mean, understanding that, you know, it was happening in the context of the pay plan, but I mean, from a peer city perspective, from a DA's office, public defender's office, I mean, recognizing that in other cities or other municipalities, they generally raise the DA's office salaries first and correspondingly then subsequently raise those for public defenders. I mean, we have put ourselves in a pickle here. Well, I think I can take part of that question. Please. And, um, uh, part of part of the issue here is that the public defenders are metro employees. Mm -hmm. Most of the DAs are not. They are considered state employees. So what this turns into is a state is a metro supplement to the state salary. Mm -hmm. So that's why you don't have those individuals showing up on the metro side in terms of, of calculating a pay adjustment because they're technically state employees and we provide supplements. So this so is a problem unique to a city county consolidated government, right? So yeah. I so wanted to acquaint everybody with yes, So Tony, let me ask a quick question. Um, Can you help? No. When you're talking about, <laughs> when you're talking about the <coughs> Bet between these DA employees and the public defender's office employees, 
and the Public Defender's Office employees are Metro employees. And, and the DA does have some Metro employees, mm -hmm. but the majority of their ADAs are state and or state, and they get supplements. Okay, so that therein lies my, my basic question: is what percentage of those that are state employees, what percentage are being supplemented by Metro? To what dollar figure? To what percentage of their salaries get supplemented? And, by and we 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 only have what the Metro share would be. So if you wanted to know what that what they're making on the state side, you'd have to request that from. Um, uh, General Fox, because we don't have access to the state information. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. I wanted to acquaint them with this complexity. It's, again, a number one item. There's That's some complexity mess. to it. Please share with me your views offline. Uh, it's been a privilege to work with finance and trying to uh, fashion a fair and balanced solution. Um, if you don't mind, let's go on to the next big mm -hmm. item on the wish list, which is school nurses. Um, and again, we heard from Dr. Joseph that's clearly MMPS's big um, single greatest priority for that. And so I'm, I'm assuming that we're open it up for discussion to, to have that as our big second most valued. Yes, Councilman. What's the interesting twist in this? Well, there is no interesting twist in this <laughs> other than that it's other than that it's a three year it's a three year rollout, and there will be an increasing. Cost, uh, I think the comments that I've heard is, um, you know, we're we're kind of doing it separate from MMTS's budget, but again, they are technically going to be working for the health department. So it was always a slightly gray area of direct employees or direct reports into MMTS. But again, um, I, we're open for discussion again as we work with the administration to craft a wish list for all of us. Just making sure that this is our big, this is our big second, second most important item. Yes, Councilman. Well, I, I'm just going to again because I've said over there as, as Council Lady Johnson, we've said over there. Uh, I don't disagree that it's necessarily needed. I do disagree oh, oh, with them sorry. reinstating yeah. some of the positions they're doing back in central okay. office because we did it when we were there, and it didn't. I'm not going to say it won't work now, but it didn't work then. And so if you're doing that, and historically, when you go through these budgets on the school board, every year they're going to do the same things we do. You've got to sit down and lay the priority list out. And so if we do this, and even though it may be a three-year rollout plan, if we're not able to accommodate the additional $7 million in this three-year plan, then ultimately what's going to happen is that those positions are going to go away anyway. I mean, it's just the, it's the way it works. And so... I guess from my standpoint, the, the increase they, they got was pretty substantial. I think, was it the second largest of any department? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so with, with that being said, I, I know it's hard to make those decisions. I, we've sat over there. I, I get how hard it is to do that. But that's what their job is. Our job is just to give them a dollar amount. And so really what we're doing here, I think, is almost <laughs> exactly what they tell us don't do is they're telling us don't tell us what to do line items on yet we're sitting right here doing a line item uh, and so from my standpoint again I know I'm not gonna be popular when I say this it's not a standpoint of not believing that they're needed I absolutely believe they're needed but philosophically I have a problem when we're getting into line items with the school board because we're told over and over and over and we'll be told again next year by the way don't get into light items with us. Thank, um, you. thank you, Councilman. I wanted to correct something I said earlier. Share with me later or offline. Actually, share with me here. Actually, mm -hmm. that's why we're all here, is to share together uh, our thoughts about this. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Council Lady Wiener, did you have a comment? Basically, all I can say is these are our kids. And at some point, we have to roll this out and we have to take a stand on what we believe is a priority. If we decide that that is a priority, within the purview of the health department and then the school board decides that they're going to contract with the health department as they have then we move forward with it if we decide that it makes more sense to stick to our guns and not give them the extra money but it still encourage the school board to adopt the school nurses then that's you've got two sides to this 
Um, but at the end of the day, these are our kids, and they deserve. Thank you, uh, Council Lady Johnson. Thank you, Chair. I I have to agree with uh, Councilman Glover on this one because I think that we uh, have missed the mark in terms of expressing how very important this item is. When the uh, school board was going through their budget, we as council members, what I have seen that we have lacked is being there while they're making those decisions before they send the budget to us at the council. When I was on the school board, that was something I always expressed. If it's something that's really important to council members, and even though we don't have line item authority, I think what we do have is we have presence uh, power. Whereas if we showed up at the time that they're making those decisions on what they would like to spend the money on when they come to us with their request, then um, I think we're in a better position to see this funded. So with that, I have to agree. I don't think this is going to go anywhere. Um, ultimately, they're going to go away. But I think what we can do is correct this for the next budget and be there at the table with the school board members. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Mendez. Um, I, I've really got a, a process question for either, I think, Mr. Jameson or Talia. Um, it, so because of what uh, Councilman Glover talked about, about not being able to um, <coughs> talk about line items, if, if we give them the, the amount of money that it would take to pay for the nurses, are they under any obligation to use it for nurses? Mm -hmm. Well, no. I'll defer no. to Council and to Taya. I mean, yeah. Mr. Jameson. Oh, is there a legal responsibility for MMPS to, to participate in the nurses program? Other than they were here saying that they would. Yes. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. Right, and it's, and it's a public health yeah, uh, expenditure. If, if, if y'all don't mind, can I actually ask Jameson the question? Please. Um, <laughs> Uh, if we allocate the money uh, for nurses, is that binding? Do they have to use it for nurses? Or because we don't have line item control, they can use it for whatever they want, technically? Uh, technically, they can use it for what they want. There's a, there's a precautionary measure where you can do it by reserve. We've not had to resort to that in the past with allocations to the MNPS. It's been a pretty good honor system on their part. All right, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, Council Lady Henderson. Just a point of clarification, this is allocated to the health department. But they still have it to the school. Let's get a clarification from our director. Um, I, I think what would happen is you would do an allocation to the Department of Health because they actually um, hire the nurses and what would have to happen is they would just have to amend their contract with schools to provide additional nurses in the school in the schools and the money would not actually have to go to the school board okay. so there would be less risk in that being allocated for something else Thank you. Back to Council Lady Henderson. And I, I apologize. I know it's not here for the earlier Thanks. MNPS yes, portion, but my question is, as we build new schools or schools historically, do we design a space for this school nurse? I mean, if we, uh, you know, are, are new schools being built uh, with a space that accommodates? I mean, if a nurse is going to engage with, uh, you know, my impression now is that someone who works in the front office, you know, gives gives the band-aids and administers the medicine and those things sort of happen in, um, you know, sort of a public, you know, the office space. But, you know, if, if you want to engage with somebody who's a medical professional, I mean, I don't know, maybe that's a counselor's room or what that is, but I don't know if the director of schools spoke to kind of the, the physical plant needs that correspond to these staffing requests and how those well, have been addressed. I apologize question. I wasn't here to pose that question um, to him, but. We're only building one school right now. Oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, any further discussion on school nurses? That, that space yes. is um, in the design um, that I'm aware of. They always factor that in. Okay. Um, however, you can have additional input. Again, if we feel as though that's something that needs to be expanded, or um, the footprint needs to be different. You can get a, a copy of what they traditionally do in our schools um, from design and construction there at the school board. Um, 
but I think we need to be at the school board meeting to make that statement publicly during that three minute comment period as council members so that it's part of the record and it's something that they know that we would like to have um, integrated in there. Thank you, Councilman. Back to Councilman Glover. Uh, and then. Talia, the current contract with the health department, I don't know if you answer this or Tom needs to answer this. The nurses that are currently provided, where is the money coming? Are, are we funding that to the health department and then the money goes to them? Yeah. No, we're doing it no. through the school budget, aren't we? Currently, it's in the school's budget, and they have a contract. Right. And they mm -hmm. will pay the school board for those nurses. Is that correct? That's that's. I'm just making sure. That's, that's the, yeah. Right. So this is that's why I said it would probably require require some type of an amendment to that to that contract based on the recommendation. So that now I have. we're not really talking about it. I'm just I'll close yeah. with this. Now we're not talking about funding the schools. Now we're talking about giving the health department. $913,000. Yes. Okay. Yes, Councilman. That was my original suggestion. Mm -hmm. That was my yes. original suggestion. Tom, you want to come over and ask? Uh, Fabian had a question about <laughs> health department. I just wanted to see a run all the way there. <laughs> so, I mean, I was, <coughs> I heard the school people telling us what they had in mind, but I was wondering if you can give us some more detail because the question about the space needed for this is, is different if you're going to have a person that's going to talk about in general health and just educate the kids on how to have healthier life choices than if you're going to do surgery or, or like cut somebody's leg off or whatever. So, I hope what, we're not doing yeah, that. but what is that? What is that you think they want to do? What do they need these nurses for? Well, there's there's a lot of evidence that supports you get better attendance. You get a lot of you got a lot better outcomes, not just for the kids, but s sometimes you can improve access for their families. The people get to know the nurse, they get to know the moms and the dads and so forth. There are a lot of ancillary benefits. Their attendance is a big thing for them. Um, if if a child comes to the there's not a nurse in the school and they go to the to, to the administrative assistant or whatever and says my stomach hurts. The, that person is not a medical professional, they're probably going to default to saying you go home. And then so now the child is out of school, you've disrupted the parents, they've got to come get them, they've got to find a place to, to care for them or whatever. It's, it can be disruptive for the, a lot of different folks. So the, in terms of the space, the, even though there's not a nurse assigned to each school, there's a nurse that goes to each school at some point. Um, so there should be, I, I don't know the details of all the MMPS schools, but there should be a place for the nurse to work at each school. Do you have statistics on the schools that tend to have higher impact of health issues, contrary to schools that rarely get this problem? I, I'm it, sure that they, they keep a track, I mean, very close track of what they do. it make sense to prioritize this investment and, and just do it on the schools that have the highest Thanks. impact? Or do you, your professional opinion is that this should be done citywide? The, uh, we're, ideally, we would have a nurse in every school. This this proposal is this nine hundred thousand dollars is the first is a first payment of what is proposed to be three consecutive years of increases of that size to get us to a point where we have a nurse for every high school and one nurse for every two other schools. Um, I think it was mentioned earlier right now, Ballock can do is the medical plans. They can't really be the school nurse in the sense that a lot of us think of it as. And I would say that we've got, I want to say it's 62. Um, seven of those are dedicated solely to Harris Hillman. They're not out into uh, the rest of the population. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Shulman. All right, so thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I got confused for a second, and maybe we got an answer, maybe we didn't. But um, it goes back to your question about um, if we were to do this, the school nurses, the money would go where? Would it go to the schools or would it go to the health department because they would be health department employees? Uh, yeah, who's going to cut the check? Well, the, you guys appropriate the money. The way it works now is it comes out of the school's budget to the health department to pay for the salaries and benefits of the nurses by contract between MMPS and, and the health department. And I guess, uh, Tom, the reason I asked the question is because of some of the, I understand overall concerns and it goes to Council A. Johnson's question as well but um, you know if we give it to the schools they can they can do what they want to because we're not supposed to give them line items uh, budgetary items 
but if we were actually to give it to the health department to do it, then they would, it would be designated they would have to do it. I think, and, and Mr. Jameson, let me just ask this question and to Talia as well. I think you open up another can of worms now because you've got, while they're all contracted through the health department, you've really got two separate issues now. You've got money that's coming from the school board that's paying for some of the nurses, and now we're allocating 913000 that goes straight to the health department. I think that in order to look at this, we want to look at it wholeheartedly, as Council Lady Johnson said, I think it's something we've got to look at next year. And if, we, if, if it's important that those nurses be in these schools, and we as a council say the nurses from a health standpoint need to be in those schools, I think it's going to have to come out of the school's budget back into here where we can allocate it to them. And we don't have that authority to do that. Yep. So that's just my two cents. Council Lady Wiener. Um, to your point, when we were in the hearings and I specifically asked them, if we were able to accommodate the school nurses and put the money in the health department budget, would you support that change? And the answer was yes. The reason that I made the suggestion was because we don't have line item veto, budgetary oversight on what they do in schools. Um, to uh, Councilman Bednay's point and question with regard to statistics, when I was actually researching it, and I am happy to provide that to Mr. Jameson to distribute, there are statistics out there that speak to page, uh, student outcomes and overall student health and welfare when you have school nurses on board. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, Council Lady Flayla. So I'm for school nurses, but I just, um, I know it's $70,000 is a lot of money and um, RNs should get paid that much. I just keep coming back to shouldn't we really look at trying to get some of these um, people who are about to graduate to come in and do some interns into our schools. And I, I can tell you, I, I don't work real closely with the school nursing program, but I can tell you that as a general rule, the health department philosophy is a very collaborative kind of thing. We have we have interns that come into clinics all the time. I, I don't know if there are special restrictions to go into a school setting and work with children. I, I don't, that would be a legal thing. They probably are. Yeah. Oh, they do that with us. Please, please. director. Right. No, they do. No, and there are certain things they can't do. They still be working under the authority of the nurse. They can't. You can't right. just turn them loose in the school. Yeah. Director. I, I, I will just briefly speak for Dr. Paul because this again was one of the pips that came forward, and uh, in that uh, proposal he said that it was really critical that these folks be able to provide some higher level care of service and that's the reason because I specifically asked the questions about LPNs yeah. because they may um, be able to provide similar services but uh, apparently there are you know there could be incidents since in a school that LPN could not take care of so they felt very strongly that um, the level of expertise required is an RN okay. Currently, Chair, I mean, if currently Please. there's no nurses there, and then, I mean, what's the difference between the cost perspective of an health, I mean, yes, in an ideal world, they would all be RNs, but what would the difference be, do we look at that, between LPNs who are licensed and RNs? Yes, they did that. We've got all that. What is the... Council Lady Johnson? Yes. Uh, just a clarifying question. I'm not arguing necessity of nurse or not, because we know that benefit. So my question is, by funding to health department. So we are uh, changing forever, forever our next three years at least, changing the funding mechanism. Used to be the NARS uh, funding were well, coming from school budget, uh, reimbursed to health. But now we are going to fund health department and directly to provide the NARS. So in other words, our health department is absorbing school budget. Well, yes, the, also, it's coming from tax dollars and going to beneficiaries I mean, through two different to, routes, but yeah, director. I, I would just like to add that you, if you did this, you are not really setting a precedent. Uh, if you just look at what we do for schools uh, and police department, the police department and its budget has the entire budget for school resource officers. None of that's funded through MMPS. All of that's sitting over there in place. And another example is uh, school crossing guards 
are also funded in the police department and not MNPS. So um, if you decided to do this and you wanted to pursue it, you're not setting a precedent. Okay. Thank you. Um, if we can. Actually, I do think we would be setting a precedent because the money for this coming year would still stay for part of the positions in the school budget, and then the other part would be coming from the council to the health department. So I think that I think there does I think there is some muddy water there. That's just my opinion, okay. but I, I think there because we're not doing the police officers that way. How we we're not doing the crossing guards that way. They don't. Okay. I, I guess the question is, is that since the, the budget we already have includes nurse salaries that are currently in the school, how would we kind of roll them into funding uh, through the health department if we yeah. went with that? Like if we funded this through going through the health department route, we still have nurses' salaries in the MNPS budget that is through. Right. And that doesn't go away. So it always stay that some of the yeah. nurses are funded through them. So we'll have two sources of funding. Yeah. But that happens throughout Metro for lots of different programs where you have a single program that may be funded by five different um, particular pieces of revenue. Okay. So that's not, in the world I live in, that's not complicated. Okay. Um, just I appreciate the discussion, but uh, being observant of people's time, the, the very strong third was additional funding for historic. Again, several people here I know have been particular sponsors for that. Again, I want to just make people aware of the results of the wish list survey that Historic is there. Any, any discussion? <laughs> yes, Councilman. What I want to just <laughs> I know that not everyone has principal districts in your neighborhoods, uh, in your in your council districts. For those of us that do, um, the amount of staff time that is required for to review building permits in accordance with the design guidelines to get their changes made so they can come before hearing so that the historic commission can make a decision in a timely manner is extensive. And as this council has graciously approved the creation of additional uh, conservation overlays as well as expansions, we have significantly added to the number of properties that may come before that board as well as we have a significant increase just in renovation and, and infill activity even within the existing district. So this council I think has, uh, or the past council, but the body has seen fit to greatly expand the number of properties that are coming before that staff. And if the staff and the commission do not make a recommendation within a certain period of time, it is deemed to be approved by right, regardless of what it is. So that sort of defeats the purpose of it. Um, so I, I know there's applications for two or for one. I would just urge everyone in this body to support at, at least the one, at least the one. I know Council Member Colby Sledge in District 17 has done an expansion. Council Member um, um, Anthony do. Davis uh, has done a, some pretty large expansions in Inglewood, and so uh, as we're, we're looking at uh, these investments in these communities, that's important. And another thing, too, just to go back to is that st state statistics show that historic districts and that type of districting overall increases property values, and so it is it will, in the long run, increase property values for the city, which will also result in favorable property tax returns. And so I think the request for one staff at a minimum okay. is, is well deserved. Councilman Elrod. Now I would just say they do a lot of other miscellaneous items. For instance, they, for name changing for roads and things, they do a long, extensive, they don't just go look, okay, it was named this. They go back to when the road was built. I mean, if you just look at the, we, for West Due West, that, it's an extensive <laughs> several page. A lot of stuff I didn't know. Yes, yeah, so, and, that, so, and, they, and that takes a lot of time of going and reviewing property records, old plats, and going through, and looking at, I'm sure, documents with gloves. So okay. they, they do. Yeah. Council Lady Johnson. Yes, uh, I'm going to be quick. I really strongly support this uh, funding. The reason is because we did a general plan update called Nashville Next. Number one guiding principle is B Nashville. B Nashville include preserving historic structure and history itself. So I think it's Pre guiding principally, uh, uh, planning prospect, policy-wide, I think it is important to have good uh, history uh, person with architectural background. Councilman Davis. I have, I have three points. Uh, first one, um, how many folks turned in the point sheets? 
Well, quite a few. We're not going to discuss the, the sheet and enough to have a strong statistical sense. Okay. And the, sec this, this, the second thing, though, is, you know, you know, of course, we know my battles, you know, we've saved over five historic buildings in my district, you know, but I just hope that we remember, you know, what we're wanting to preserve, what it's time to preserve um, union structures like Fort Nagley and some of those concerns, you know, when we're talking about that, because, you know, just personally, now I've saved my share of historic plantations. I'm tired of saving plantations and Confederate monuments. And I know none of you have said that, but I'm just putting that on the on the record when we start looking at historic preservation in the city of Nashville and reminding people about Nashville's history. You know what I mean? So I just want I just want to put that out there. Okay. Thank you, Councilman. Um, just moving on, being respectful of people's times, uh, audit, the $100,000 request for special funding from audit place fourth in people's priorities. Um, again, um, uh, big expanding city. I don't know that there's any more discussion with that, but I wanted people to place where that was. Actually, next came uh, codes, which we've had a pretty vibrant discussion on codes. The question of, in fact, do you risk having a fee study, which is somewhat expensive, uh, to raise codes money beyond what the codes increase is. Councilman Glover. I, I mean, I think several of us have echoed, we don't think the service level is there to justify raising any, any fees. Uh, I, I, that's my gut feeling on that, number one. Number two, I think in order to get the customer service level there to where at some point, and I'm not going to ever support raising the fees, but if, if that was something that was even going to be on the table, I think you need the additional staff that they've requested. It was originally requested uh, in order to accommodate because uh, while I think there's inequities in, in, with the attorneys and this and that, I guarantee you I, I never get a phone call complaining about the, the, the DAs or I don't get phone calls on that. I get phone calls on codes just like each one of us in our district to get phone calls on that. So. My vote is that, that that one needs to be done. That that needs to be done. Uh, you mean to 828? Uh, the funding of the 828 yeah. for the codes. So down okay. on this list, there are a number of things for codes, but none of them have funds attached to them. We... For sources? Or you mean well, they all have zero because we're sliding things from one place from to one another. From one place to another. To another. Adding. Right. What, what are we saying we're supporting <clears throat> or not? Well, um, I think every, it's too complicated to have a simple scenario for it. I think the vice chairman's question was very important as to what do they think are their highest priorities. Right. What does that cost? Uh, I think listening to this group indicate what their changes are the highest priorities, particularly if we're not in a, in a changing the fee world. Did, did, did they, didn't they give us, and I'm, I'm recalling it out of memory, maybe I'm, maybe I'm recalling it incorrectly, <coughs> nine additional positions at a cost of eight hundred twenty eight thousand dollars was that not that's correct eight twenty eight okay yeah. okay yeah. okay uh, but again chairman again part of that is is balancing and doing what we can again okay. uh, having a sense from this group that the simple idea of raising fees to pay for some of this is probably not that good an idea and so that's going to be informative okay. going forward. Councilman? Was it not the case that the, the fees that are currently being generated more, I mean, more sort of offset the, the cost of the staff anyway? It's double. Well, What's, is my we memory wrong? I've got my book in front of me. Positive. Positive. We need a fees to meet it, Director Cobb just gave me this. Um, uh, you, look, so Director Cobb gave me this. Like the, the net amount for the, the staffing was 660800 and then for three vehicle purchases, which was going to come out of 4% funds. Hey, I've got it right here. We can see yeah. that. Yeah. Is this, do you look yeah. at that? It's for the 168000 mm -hmm. uh, So, but, but still, it would have to be in the operational, even if it's going to come out of the 4%. So the 828 eight would be the net number if all of the positions and the vehicles that required to fill those positions were done. Correct. Right? Okay. Thank okay. you, Chair. Thank you, Council Lady Winner. The only point that I want to make is while we have a 12 and a half million dollar plus surplus from this particular department and yet we have terrible customer service because they need more help in there 
the one thing that's the most alarming to me and why I would really recommend that we look at adding more zoning examiners is because we've got some that are getting ready in the very near future to retire. And the sooner that we get people on board in that department to be up to the task of managing this from an institutional knowledge standpoint, when these guys retire, the better off we are. Okay, thank you. It comes by whether it's I would I would add a serious point. You know, the zoning examiners, when someone brings in a site plan or a building plan, you know, we pass overlays, we pass all these codes. That's the zoning examiner that might have seven minutes to look at that plan to make sure that what's submitted actually meets the codes that we're all passing. We need to make sure that they have the staff. To, to do that appropriately. Otherwise, not only are they are is there a greater chance that the laws that we're passing are going to be enforced from the get-go, but uh, you know that in some cases could create public safety problems. Councilman Elra. Speaking of public safety problems, if, he, if Director Cobb's number one priority literally goes to the health and safety of the buildings. It's one thing to examine the zoning and making sure it's correct. It's another thing to making sure that the gas pipe is all is corrected and the electrical is it's corrected and the, you know it it what it doesn't matter the zoning the building blows up yep. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it's it's all right um, uh, thank you for but it's going to this discussion this uh, again um, moving beyond codes uh and to some items that were fairly heavily ranked but not quite at the level of these others was uh, uh, public works. Again, uh, this was uh, Jeremy's uh, wish list item that got a lot of votes. Was for a general uh, countywide public works uh, funding of programs that had been in public works. His original budget did not make it all the way through the budget process. Is to try to fund um, the transportation and right of way maintenance programs that were in Mark Sutherland's budget. Uh, and that the, the, you add those two items together, which I confirmed with them yesterday, is a, of course, is a priority and a best use. That if you gave them money, this is what they would use it for, and that is up to seven hundred thousand uh, dollars for for those two areas in his budget, which is again, crew, people, and trucks doing stuff for transportation and for right of way maintenance. Um, Brush collection would be an additional $69,000, for example, but this is quite a big step uh, having those. And again, that is countywide. That's every district would benefit from it. It's clearly something that is needed. But again, the, it, um, it received a lot of votes in the last several days. And again, I wanted, and again, I, I know Jeremy put that in and his wish list item if people would like to talk about that. Yes. So carefully, he had on the curbside recycling imposing a fee for the second trash can, which is actually revenue as opposed to a cost. Well, and that's our next set of bullet points, <laughs> if you didn't mind. Uh, yeah, we have a fee for the third. But in terms of, of people's general we never, priority we for that, I've, again, I've, I've, I'm trying to get a sense of the council as we go forward and try to craft something balanced. Yes, Council Lady. Can I just inquire? I mean, I'm looking in our public works section, Councilman Elrod, what you added there. I see the recycling specific, but I see, I mean, other public works requested but unfunded. I know you're saying trucks out there are doing such, but I mean, if we looked at that more particularly with public works, given what they were funded and what they would well, I, I did I yesterday. Mean, I did not bring with me okay. that spreadsheet okay. between what was requested and what was funded, and these these were two sets of items. Again, I think to them it is somewhat fungible because you're funding crews with trucks, and if there's snow, you do snow, and if you do, you know, traffic, you do traffic. But you're out there doing that, so I, I don't think that to them in conversation that there's a hard or fast program particularly, it is a little bit lumpy in the sense of people cost what they cost and trucks cost what they cost, but it's basically anywhere from one hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars would be useful to them in terms of having more people to say go do stuff uh, out in the county. And again, but I got we have the we have the sponsor here. Well it, I mean part of it was is the right of way was for the permits is that is something that there's to increase fees, there is absolutely much more room in the ceiling to increase fees. I mean, the fees, I think you could, I haven't done a study, but I would imagine you do a comparable study to sister cities, and our fees are very low, and I'm, and the development community has even said, we're, they're, they're willing to pay higher fees if it goes to more people to help them get their permits faster and get inspections done faster. So to me, this is an easy, something easily done. 
Um, I'm going to have some legislation next month to, to start tackling some of that, um, depending on how the budget goes. Um, but I think, you know, when we went to, uh, a few of us went to the luncheon that uh, supported the public works employees, there are guys in trucks that go out and break their backs every day, moving stuff, cutting stuff down, and it doesn't get any kind of glory, but it it helps us with our constituents, and it helps all across the county. It helped downtown here, you know, moving stuff around or downtown here during you know all the Predator celebration. Um, this is literally, you know, we have schools, we have safety, but we have making sure our right of way is taken care of, and that to me is an essential part of uh, local government. Well, and then. And then moving on a little bit to a related discussion, uh, again, are three sources of fee increase that would provide additional services that were mentioned in the council projects. One is fire inspection, where you have a fee increase. Another is the potential for additional recycling, which would have an additional fee. And then finally, these same permit inspection. Now, the reason I bring this up is to do any fee increase, you have to have a study to justify the fee increase. So the question is putting study money in the wish list for specifically these three fee increases to increase those services, Council Lady. I mean, the, the curbside recycling has been in the public works this would be for years. The second bin. For it's, it's been the plan for years. It okay. was supposed to happen in 2014. It is not new. We've done that. Okay. Study. Well, we've done that study, so we can save the money on that yeah. study. Okay. I don't. I don't know how the study turned out, but I hope it indicated the need. Yeah, I mean, it, it was supposed to happen. There was a schedule. It just okay. Got All right. Out. Very good. So we would be down to two studies, uh, if assuming that we did not do a code study, it would be a uh, permit inspectors and a fire inspector study to increase the fees to provide more service in those areas. Yes, Council Lady. What's the cost of the study time? Um, Fifty to seventy-five thousand somewhere. Would be my guess. That's what we've paid in the past for. Fee studies. You get a discount if we were two at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and it was funded by July. Two for one. Yeah. Exactly. Just wrote 75 if you want to do it. Just um, strong arm somebody to okay. make it work. Um, thank <laughs> you. If you want now, to do it. You're all aware of other wish list items. I'm grouping these up front as to be a priority to try to find the money to pay for them and to bring this up in discussion. and. Uh, any other items? Now, some things that are not particularly on here, for example, we may have heard about, and I, I see some sponsors here, but they did not get that many votes, this is the state trial court's request, for example. Uh, but again, I just wanted to sort of with the will of the group. Yes, Councilman? Can I go to one of my items? Yes, you can talk about your item too. That also just narrowly missed the top seven, though. Well. Uh, this yes, is sir. the only one that is going to save people from dying uh, okay. because we have uh, people dying in Nashville every day for speeding and, and traffic accidents. And just we had a, in Jacobia, that was in my district on Blue Hole Road and uh, Bell Road, just we had a people's person die just last week. Uh, and so this happens a lot outside the court of the city. People, uh, the police is engaging in protecting us from crime, so they will put their roadblocks on high crime areas. They won't do them on places where people are speeding necessarily. So what I'm suggesting is that we create a dedicated traffic enforcement force that only deals with traffic enforcement, not based on crime, but based on traffic problems. And that, for example, on Holt Road, where people are speeding and people can't get out of their houses, we all have those roads where people are unable to exit their home to even, uh, they're even afraid to go get their mail because people are speeding so badly. So what I'm suggesting, we start a pilot program where we, ha we hire a police officer and a patrol car and we just move this person around the city to all those hot areas that we all have in our districts to try to slow down traffic, to keep people from driving on the median, people uh, ignoring stop signs, people that are speeding through uh, subdivisions at 70 miles an hour. And that's what I'm asking. It's $170,000, uh, and uh, it, will, it will be a good way to try to deal with quality of life okay. issues. Quick question for our director. The car would be a 4% money, so it would really just be the, the cost of a person doing that. Yeah. There would be a cost of a person, but there would be things like maintenance and gas and okay. things like that. But it would be small. Yes. Council Lady. I just want to say that this would be great. I get so many calls on speeding, and when I call 
you know, Midtown, they will say, we get the calls too. They're bombarded. They don't get calls saying somebody broke in the house. They get calls saying, can you please get somebody out here? They're spading. So this is a hot, hot issue in the entire Midtown Hills okay. police precinct. Uh, Council A. Yeah, I just, I, I want to speak to that kind of from a safe streets perspective. And, you know, I too have spoken, um, my district goes across two precincts. Um, and I, so I think, you know, kind of from a leadership perspective, I know that, um, you know, traffic enforcement or speeding enforcement is somewhat a, a fraught issue sometimes in varying communities. But in those communities that are specifically requesting, like, I can't go to my mailbox or it's dangerous, um, you know, my kids can't bike to their friends' houses or we don't have sidewalks and we just need to walk places safely. I think um, just the broader conversation from a leadership standpoint of how the various precincts are staffed and the traffic, I mean, you know, there used to be a whole traffic enforcement force of motorcycles and that's all they did was speeding enforcement. And then we moved to sort of a different model and there is, you know, the, the traffic um, motor that is in the particular precincts now to seemingly address this issue, but they are only dealing at peak times with wrecks, right? So they never have the time, and that's what I continue to hear, and I'm sure you all hear, we just don't have the staffing um, to address it. So um, I think, you know, I, I welcome this conversation, but I wonder if from a leadership perspective, if we really look into all the precincts about how they are organized and what we are intentionally and proactively doing around speeding enforcement, I think we have a bigger impact um, if we um, handle you know, it I mean, institutionally. Yeah, I mean, this is the one car that's going to rotate around. I, okay. With all, I mean, I share your concern truly, and I'd, I'd love to work with you on it because I've already been having some conversations. Okay. But um, I wonder if maybe that's the best. Okay. Well, I appreciate approach. the discussion, Councilman Withers. I really have to echo a lot of uh, Councilmember Henderson's points. Even in urban areas, we have lots of speeding issues and people blocking corners. And uh, Gallatin Road has one of the highest levels of pedestrian fatalities from people speeding and hitting them. Um, so we have a lot of infrastructure needs in our county that we're slowly starting to address. We are continuing to open new police precincts, which will also help to shrink some of the coverage areas. That might help. And, uh, and I just believe that we need to combine our all of our forces with our Department of Transportation on infrastructure, on public education, as well as w with the police force all working together. I, I'm not confident that one officer or one or a couple of cars would be able to cover a specific area really enough to, to make as much of a difference as we need at this point. I think we need to hang on to that and make that a, a priority in our conversations about infrastructure, public education, or driver and pedestrian education, as well as the police staffing for next year. Council Lady Johnson, I know you had your... <coughs> um, I appreciate Councilman Bedney uh, bringing this item because I can tell you it's needed. I've put points on this particular item simply because one area in particular in my area, down Castlegate Drive, a lot of senior citizens walk on the bike lanes because of the lack of sidewalks. They want to walk in that neighborhood, but people drag race down that street and dang near run them over. Their mailboxes always knocked over along that area. Uh, we just recently had to get a special exception at the appeals level for a stop sign. The hope, and then stop signs are not even supposed to be used to slow people down. But in this particular case, it's gotten so bad that they don't feel safe walking in their neighborhood because of the speeding cars. And the, the police department, I call all the time, and they just literally don't have somebody there uh, to do that. So one car to me that circulates around and we have access to that is better than none. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Bennett. And, yes. and just from a development perspective, I can tell you that it's very hard for us council members to support the developments that are going to increase our tax base when people are saying, I don't want to see a single car anymore on the street because they are just overwhelming our capacity. So unless we can restore confidence that people are safe in the city, they are going to continue being what we're trying to avoid, which is the NIMBY thing. If we yes. want them to be NIMBY, like the mayor says, we got to give that quality of life to people. So I'm sorry. This is, I promise I'm just not going to do this every time I speak, so this is I just... I like it. <laughs> 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 
Um, it, it, it does have an impact. Okay, Councillor Ehrt. Um, with all due respect, you know, I and, and I guess I'm looking at things in a more global situation here, and 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 I, I know Councilwoman Weiner talked about these are our children, but for us to talk about a, a, a police officer to to manage traffic, when it seems to me that police officers that are already in that area can monitor this and they just need to be a be, do a better job and they need to be held accountable when we have sick people that are not getting the help that they need when we don't have the equipment that they need and they the, those sick people include children they include senior citizens and everything in between and i think we need to be thinking and working on things of a more global um, uh, uh, issue than any specific uh, matters. With all due respect to the council people, because I know what they need to do for their districts, and I appreciate that. But okay. I, thank you, yeah. Council Lady Dowell. Yeah, I'll just go back. I think that's three totally unrelated issues, and all of them are equally important. I think the issue that we're seeing in our area, and I think I've heard you all loud and clear with the Black Lives Matter. What I heard. A sitting is there that you, some of the areas feel over policed. Uh, they're sitting on their corners, stopping people for no reasons. And what I hear from my constituents is that we do not have that same level of service. We don't have uh, police riding down our corridors that frequently. And it's because our area has been, we, we've sacrificed. We get the brand of being the high crime area, yet every time we open up a new precinct, and the last three, four have been opened up to service many of the areas around the urban core that they're trying to keep safe for obvious reasons because we have tourists there. But it's the people in the community that are paying taxes and paying for this service and they're not receiving it. And it's, it's really hurting our ability from a business perspective out in Southeast Nashville because one of the biggest things I hear is that they're concerned about not having a presence of police officers yet we're on the news every night because we're the bad area of town. Now we have, in my opinion, um, create a bigger problem because we've gone to putting these schools inside subdivisions. And, and that's a bigger issue because you want these community schools. So now we have these schools lodged in the middle of a 300 home subdivision with one way in and one way out. And our HOAs are having to hire police officers out of their HOA money that is supposed to go toward the community to patrol it. And it's not right, it's not fair, and it's not equitable. And um, we are due a police precinct, we are, but we have, if you look at it, about 25% of the population in Southeast Nashville, 134 apartment complexes out there, which are little cities within themselves, and, and we do not have sufficient police officers to cover those areas. They're high dense areas, you know, most of the time they're uh, two police cars at one particular call, and so we're splitting. Uh, Council Lady Johnson's district split between Hermitage and South. South goes all the way down to downtown to help out. So we're not getting coverage. You know, we're not getting the coverage we deserve and the coverage that we need. And 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 as far as I know, I've been promised a police precinct. I've asked for it from the first day I came in, and I've watched them build three since then in other areas. So we do need a traffic person designated and a resource for our area. It, this person, we understand how it needs to work. Um, it's not a global issue in my opinion because like I said, I heard you all have coverage, but it's, you know, we have an issue, we have a problem, and I do think uh, the resource will be utilized and it will help take out some of the expenses from the HOAs. And additionally, it's a safety issue. That may be the, I don't know, because our area is so split up, but we've had about eight people killed in the last a month from hit and run accidents and car accidents. So it is it, a big issue and we need okay. to do something. Thank so. you, Council Lady. Real Thank quickly, you. Councilman Withers. I would suggest that uh, until a new precinct is built, that the council members in that area, or, or maybe even all council members, just have a discussion with Chief Anderson and the police generally if we feel that some areas are overstaffed and others okay. under, that we could reallocate We've within the community. All right, and okay. then we're going to move on. Chair, can I, let me, so Councilman Withers, um, We've already We're addressed that with um, with South Precinct. Council Lady Johnson and I, we had a public okay. safety meeting yesterday. Um, Council Lady Dow may want to collaborate with, with uh, Councilman Batney for their particular area, but 
We're, we're, we're doing that out. And we're going to stay on budget. Council lady. We've all had that conversation. We've done money, many ride alongs. They don't give they don't give tickets you know they only give you know 20 percent tickets so we're not okay. even creating revenue so there's so much involved they don't have time to do this so okay this is a very Real needed quickly, Councilman Johnson. Yeah, quickly. Budget. i do support uh council member betner's point okay. because in my district number one complaint i get is speeding and safety because people speed a forest stop actually in um, my forest stop there's a biker was hit by the car and uh, because didn't pay much attention. Okay. It, right. You know, police presence is really necessary okay. to increase the safety. Okay, I, I hear you loud and clear that the need at Council Lady Johnson, a budget. I want to clarify that we have had, I have been also advocating for a police precinct since the moment yes. I was elected in this office. Okay. That's not our issue. Our issue is safety, where the schools okay. are, as senior citizens try to get out in the neighborhood, people are drag racing down the street, and this is a very important issue in the suburban areas. We need this. Okay. Um, all right, we're coming up on two and a half hours, and I want to uh, be committed to having the meeting. A final item that's pointed out is a council office support. Always a difficult subject. Uh, there's been a question of an IT support person or a financial analyst support person. I believe some parties in the council staff would feel that an IT support person would be of profound help to them. So that has been requested. Yes, Council Lady Weiner. I just want to speak to the notion that we are working towards enhanced community engagement. And if we're able to bring this position on board, it would go a long way towards not only streamlining the dashboard that we're working on that will also be accessible to our constituents, but the enhanced engagement opportunities that they'll have with us. Okay. So I strongly support that. Uh, $80,000, $85,000 from that. All right, well, thank you. I'm grateful to everybody being here. Um, Council Lady? Since I'm here, I will bring up the 50 forward um, uh, question again, and I appreciate uh, those of you who have allocated any points toward it. Um, and uh, I hope that there, if there's any questions that remain as we move forward to that, that, uh, that they get asked so that we can help, help them out. Councilman Davis. Um, and I don't know and you know how the point system works, <laughs> but as a minority caucus and as you know talking with members of the Hermitage and Donaldson and Madison area, we wanted to work we worked together and I went and sought where we could take funding to help in full motion and 50 forward. Right. Okay. And you know, usually and and you and I love your process. It's a great change. Okay, that you've done, um, Chairman. But some but usually why maybe I'm just old school. How we we've been doing it in the past is, you know, like, hey, you wanna fund this area, find areas where you can cut the funds. You know? And I came prepared to say where well, we're going to cut it to fund 50 forward and in full motion and i don't know if okay. you know some of us had to work and we not everybody has turned in their forms and I, i'm assuming the top 10 items you found other forms of funding for well um let me just spend a, a moment on this if you've not submitted a source please do every source that has been submitted to me i've talked to finance about extensively and um Often people use the same sources, so it becomes difficult to match sources and uses. Um, so going forward, hopefully tomorrow, here, here are several things, is uh, with the administration's concurrence and uh, in a joint effort with them, we will circulate a substitute trying to fund as many of the wish list items as possible as possible in a balanced way. Um, the strategy on sources is taking everybody's suggestions and walking through that, but by and large, there are not, there are no, unless somebody shows up and tells me right now that there's a program that they want to cut, that it is not a programmatic change from the mayor's program, but it is a sharpened pencil approach where Often very small amounts of money come from various things that with finances concurrence that it is possible to do. 
um, that it is possible to do, and then that will be the basis of the funding of this. I do hope that there will be a wish list funding that is a multiple of what's ever happened in the, in the past. But we are working together, and what will be presented will be something that the administration has signed off on uh, for the council. Yes, Council Lady Johnson. We hope. We hope. Yes. Would you tell me the deadline to submit those requests and to in order to come this substitute? Really was some time ago, but feel free to share it with Rosie. Okay. Uh, but but at 11 o'clock tomorrow, I feel yeah. like this the substitute will be finalized. So it definitely 10:55 technically, I guess, but it's pretty far along. Yes, Councilman Davis. All right, if we can go over. I've identified where, and since we're all here and we're on Channel 3, where we can make the cuts from, from various areas, you know what I mean? Okay. You know, for 54 and for, you know, in full motion. Well, feel free to suggest your cuts. Yep. All right. And. Um, 100,000 from Second Harvest. On the grand from that, will they'll be still getting the increase? Um, a hundred thousand from the Adventure Science Museum. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm at priorities. I mean, you got you know, we try to service the, the seniors and the youth in the community, we talk about it, but it, you know. Yeah, I mean, um, the second harvest is where we feed. Come on, the councilman. That's yeah, well, I'm here. Okay. okay. Well, all right. That's for that's that. Now we're now we're okay. looking at fit for fifty forward. That's where okay. I was doing the two hundred thousand for um for in full motion. Now it was what two fifty or was it two hundred? It was two fifty for um fifty forward. Two hundred for fifty forward. No, two fifty for in full motion and two fifty for fifty yeah. forward. Yeah. Okay. All right, fifty thousand from the seed program. The seed program. Yes. The what? The funnels. It, it's it's a, a jump starter for. A and and some of the stuff I did talk to Mr. Reblin about. He didn't. Uh, you know, I mean, not trying to put him on Front Street. All right, but you know, the, the, we funded the seed program last year, and I'm not for sure, but it's in there again. And I, and and for my regulation, I could be wrong. We were only supposed to fund that once. Okay. So 50 grand from the seed program. We need 150 more. Here we go. Here I come. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it was gonna be. It's gonna be fun. Okay. Well, you know what I mean, I think 25. Even though I love this place from the Civic Design Center. Oh well, no. <laughs> well, and please turn it in. But but as we as we wrap up here, I have another thought for everybody that I need your help on. So we had the budget process last year, we've had this process this year. It is not perfect, obviously. Yeah. And how we he's want to do this. He's not done, Chair. Come on, he's, he's not, not done. done. Let's okay. hear it. Let's hear it. Ooh. Okay, well, you, you can feel free to write them down and, and give them to Rosie no, as everybody else did. All right, and, and um, $200,000 from the Titans improvements. Okay. Uh, we can't take anything out of that. You can't that's touch that. Okay. Yeah, we can't. All these are noted. All right. Uh, what about? Okay, I, had a, I wasn't sure about. I wasn't sure uh, about. When it. is the deadline to submit Farmers amendments market. to the budget? And then after that point, those amendments would be will be late filed and require suspension. I defer to council. So you can amend on third, but any amendment has to have been considered by the budget finance committee, and that last meeting is Monday. So, so tomorrow. So, tomorrow. so the, the, the Monday meeting next is coming Monday. The, the amendment has to be considered by the budget committee meeting on Monday. So when is the deadline to get just noon tomorrow? Tomorrow. tomorrow. Noon, tomorrow. Yeah. noon tomorrow. Noon tomorrow. Noon tomorrow. Noon tomorrow. Right. Now, I do have a question about this. Um, this was the million dollars that we have to give Nashville, right? This curb music for entertainment. That's the, yes. We, are, we had a, we had this sound of that. But again, <laughs> Councilman, feel free to write all these down and give them to me. In every case, I tell you, I promise you, we, I've been working with finance closely to see what's available and what's not available. But as we wrap up, and I know Council Lady Weiner is here, think of the improvements that you want in this process for next year. I got, okay. I got a procedural question. Yes. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair. 
Uh, Mr. Jameson, all right, how many votes do we need to amend it on the floor? If I were to do an amendment, taking okay. funds from certain areas for those two programs, uh, will 27 votes get me what I need? That's 21? Okay. Okay. And with that, I'm grateful to everybody being here. I want to thank the director and uh, uh, and let's declare this meeting, the Budget Finance Committee, to be adjourned until Monday. I didn't touch the floor until Monday. I didn't touch the Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.